everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, can you hear both of us okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so um, hi. Um, our topic is the future is messy. Uh, and this is because we believe that uh, companies all around the world are causing great disruption in various industries. Um, sometimes governments are causing uh, disruptions in various industries. Uh, so in today's talk, we'll be talking about um, how we see digital leading this change um, and how we believe that uh, inculcating a mindset of, of design uh, that's user-centered uh, is actually going to help us navigate this disruption and make some sense of it and, and build something useful uh, at the end of this. Uh, my name's Sneha. I've worked with uh, ThoughtWorks for several years. At the time of submitting uh, this talk, uh, I used to work with ThoughtWorks products, our uh, products division. Um, I used to manage uh, an agile project management tool, which when it was launched many years ago, we believed was the first uh, digital card wall, which is now so mainstream. Uh, since though I've uh, moved out of that role, uh, I currently work with our uh, clients in Southeast Asia, um, startups in various stages, helping them with their product strategy and setting up teams offshore that can help them execute on that strategy. We joined here with uh, Mike Sapto. Uh, hi. Uh, so uh, I started my journey in ThoughtWorks uh, in 2003, uh, played roles of business analyst, uh, program manager, project manager, uh, in with different clients, like small clients, about 10 people, to about clients which had about 200 people in our teams. Uh, I've also interspersed that with doing some roles within operations, uh, running an office, starting off practices, uh, being part of the demand team, and working with the market in Europe. Uh, my current role is that of uh, the head of operations or uh, CEO for ThoughtWorks India, where I basically look after uh, how we are servicing clients, uh, how we are bringing on board people, and how we are basically looking at improving the way we actually deliver software through our people. Uh, so as Sneha mentioned, we would want to share with you like our thought process in, in terms of the journey that we have taken as an organization, because uh, we have been using uh, Agile pretty much uh, since 99-2000. And a large part of the conversation that we'll be having today will be using examples, some for clients that we'll name and some for clients that we won't be able to name. But it will talk you through the design thinking approach and how we have applied that. All right, so. Oh. Uh, all right, so we believe that uh, the world has seen four industrial revolutions um, so far. Um, the first was when you know steam became uh, a way to mechanize production. Uh, and that changed the way various businesses were run and opened up opportunities for, for new ways to run businesses. The second uh, industrial revolution started with the advent of electricity, uh, because then mass production was enabled, and that, that created more opportunities. Then we believe the uh, advent of the internet brought about the third industrial revolution because that spawned off so many internet businesses and changed the way people were doing business. Uh, the World Economic Forum dubs what we're in right now as the uh, fourth industrial revolution where technology is at the heart of value. Um, and what this really means is that businesses today uh, no longer see IT as a separate department, as a supporting department, but actually crafting business models around the technology that's available at that time, at the time which is right now. Uh, for, for example, if you take Netflix, um, if streaming as a technology had not come about, Netflix would have never figured out a business model where they can use it uh, to create you know, a new offering for their customers. And now that they have, traditional cable companies are at threat uh, completely, and they don't know how to deal with this change, this kind of disruption that's happening in their industry. And all the time we're hearing about this, right? Every supermarket chain is worried about the threat that Amazon uh, is posing on them, and they're wondering how to catch up. And that's where really all of, all of the industries is really it's very hard to think of an industry today that's not uh, being disrupted by some sort of technology ad advancement that's happening in this space. Um, so where we're, uh, what we're really thinking about and something for you to think about as we uh, proceed today is uh, tech is no longer a separate function, which is just getting requirements that are thrown over a wall to them and then executing and throwing something back. Tech is actually at the heart of every business, and a business is crafted around tech. And the scale at which this is happening is, is unfathomable uh, at this point. Uh, most industries, most companies don't know how to get around this sort of complexity that this is causing. Uh, entire systems have to now be rethought. Because in the past, if you think about it, when steam came in, when electricity came in, it was about automating manual processes, right, to make them faster, to reduce manual labor, um, to make things uh, higher quality, for instance. Uh, but today, what the kind of disruption we're thinking about is uh, it's not just to automate things. It's actually to think about things being done, should things that were done a certain way for several decades being done completely differently like Netflix has. 
so it's, it's causing a kind of um, complexity that no one's ever dealt with before. And today we'll be talking about you know, some of our clients and how they've steered through that. Yeah. So before we do that, like, let's just look back in terms of how we've actually got here. And around that, like uh, Sanya spoke about uh, the third industrial revolution. And that brought to the fore certain ways of actually uh, looking at problem spaces, breaking them down, and actually solving them. Uh, so Adam Smith like introduced this whole way of what we call reductionist engineering, which essentially takes a problem space, which is well defined, well understood, and then decomposing it into component parts, subcomponent parts. A large part of it was how do you break down a problem, decompose it into small parts, analyze, solve that specific problem, and then decompose it, bring everything together to actually finish the solution. Now this kind of problem spaces, like if you look at it, uh, so the y-axis showing uh, uncertainty, and the x-axis showing the scale of such problems that you could solve. Like essentially you're talking about ones which are fairly certain, so the uncertainty is low, the change is low, and you can actually scale it out in terms of this particular approach. Uh, what this does mean is that it does take a fair degree of time. Like some of these projects could actually run for years, where you're do doing the problem understanding, the, the decomposition, the analysis, the build, and then recomposing and putting everything together. Uh, now, if we were to look at the other end of the spectrum and start thinking of like what this led to. So a large part of what this whole approach in terms of uh, decomposing well understood problems, uh, doing that analysis and build led to is management structures, which really started resulting in ways in which the primary objectives was to actually reduce and mitigate the un uncertainty. So it was all about risk mitigation. How do you put in structures which were around approval, command and control, which really meant that all you were trying to do is, as the different components were being decomposed, you were putting an approval process to ensure that the respective steps were done the way the approval had been given. So that when the whole thing was composed back together, it would work because you had very little ability to actually adapt and respond to change in this kind of a model. So this is basically at one of the end of the spectrum and uh, Today, like as we move uh, forward, we brought about another end of the spectrum, which is types of problems where you know that there's going to be a lot of change. There's a lot of uncertainty. So there's a fair degree of discovery which has to be done. So in this kind of an approach, there was this whole need of looking at a problem space, picking up a very specific small problem, and then trying to see that, okay, what can I learn about that space? What can I go and try out there? And basically use this whole cycle of the test, learn, evaluate, apply, and then again learn. And this became very apparent with uh, a lot of the things which like started in the lean manufacturing world, where there was production processes, production systems, where you didn't want to really impact operations. You wanted to it to go as per plan. But at the same time, you wanted to bring in improvements. You wanted to bring in incremental change. And this kind of approach is uh, what basically allowed us to move ahead. Now, if you look at these two, the, the second one deals with uncertainty, deals with change, but you have to do it at a small scale. So what it essentially means is that as we start looking at the class of problems that we are encountering today, with the kind of rapid change which is happening, the fourth industrial revolution, there's this huge white space which is out there. And this white space is something which we will have to tackle. But before we get into that white space, let's just move a little ahead in terms of seeing like how, uh, in, in terms of uh, understanding things which are changing a lot faster than, let's say, of a standard SDLC model, led us to another way of actually solving software problems. So in the early 90s and 2000s, there were opportunities where, uh, with the internet becoming uh, 
pretty much accessible to a lot of folks. Uh, there were digital products being built, especially on the web and mobile. Now, this allowed that whole approach of looking at change, uh, addressing that uncertainty, and starting to iterate through uh, what essentially became the lean product model, where you started to understand a class of users, come up with a solution, take out MVPs into market, and then iterate through the product build. Uh, so this allowed us to like start, uh, and a large part of what we talk about in Agile around feeling fast, uh, doubling down, pivoting quickly, started actually getting ingrained in the way we work. Uh, and this essentially was a big change that we started seeing. Now, I spoke a little while earlier about this space, the, the right hand side still being an empty space. Because now you had two ways of solving problems. Problems which were well understood, problems which were not that well understood, and you were trying to tackle some degree of uncertainty. The class of problems that we are now starting to encounter brings a quantum leap in terms of the uncertainty. And this is what we are referring to as the messy middle, because in terms of the scale at which we are having to solve these problems, uh, they are at a much larger scale. And uh, if we start thinking through like what causes this kind of complexity, uh, so a lot of this is in terms of the different types of users there are. It's no longer a single user and a single type of user who is basically giving you requirements. So you are literally trying to figure out a solution where you can't make everybody happy, but you are trying that. There are innumerable connections which start coming in. And this is in terms of the different processes which may be there. Uh, so we are talking about large scale digital transformation. Organizations trying to change from being a traditional business to a digital business. So that means existing systems and processes and all those interconnections have to be overhauled. At the same time, like in today's world, in the fourth industrial revolution, the speed at which technology is changing means that you don't always know that the technology that you're going to apply, whether it will solve the problem. So you're going to take some incremental steps to try things out. That means solution architectures, technologies that you try out, they also have to be trialed out and put out there and have to go through that whole feedback and pivoting loop. So net-net, like when we're talking about building these systems, so you don't have any patterns which you can draw upon. A large part of what we did uh, over the 2000s in the agile world was being able to apply patterns. There are so many books which have been put out there in terms of design patterns, patterns in which you build certain types of systems. But this whole paradigm is what's shifting right now. So we are not really good at solving these messy <coughs> problems. And as we said, like we want to take the whole approach around design thinking to see, okay, can we solve these messy problems? And how have we had some successes? I just want to take a feel of the room. Uh, how many people are familiar with the design thinking steps, these five steps of design thinking? OK, cool. I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time on this then. Uh, the design thinking um, approach um, is all about thinking uh, about the uh, about the users much earlier in the life cycle of a product, right? Rather than when the requirements have been firmed up and then you're starting to build and then you're testing with the customer. Uh, this is about actually trying to design uh, your solution itself around the around the end user right from the start. Uh, so not uh, not only at the point when uh, you know our solution's already figured out and you know it's already gone into uh, into development, uh, but much earlier in the game where you're trying to figure out the idea itself. Uh, by understanding the user, uh, rather than by understanding the process or the industry, uh, but actually put the user at the heart of every solution and design around them. Um, so typically, you know, uh, this process is broken down into five steps. Where, uh, you know, first you try and understand uh, what an end user might look like, uh, what what are their you know day-to-day -day motivations and gains, and what what's what's irking them right now, uh, and how we can uh, start to solve some of their problems. And de defining the problem statement from the perspective of the user, rather than you know, a problem that exists in the industry that needs to be solved. Um, so how we define the problem itself, how we articulate the problem, has to come from the uh, perspective of the user. And then we brainstorm, uh, do blue sky thinking, and figure out all kinds of possible solutions uh, to this problem. 
some things that may not even exist today, right, may not even be possible, but just to keep our options completely open and then see if we can innovate using those, those ideas which are, which are really blue sky. And then we don't go out there and start build out the whole solution. And this, I think, is familiar to everyone, where we first start to build out you know, a small prototype or a quick uh, minimum viable product and test that, get feedback on that with, uh, with the same users, and iterate as we go. Um, so the process of involving the user and, 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 the, and keeping them at the heart of the process starts much, much earlier in the product life cycle. And that's really what design thinking is all about. Um, so what we'll be doing is spending some time uh, on examples where we think our clients and we have worked well on, on each of these uh, different places, where they put the user at the heart of the uh, problem and done a good job with dealing with that messiness that Sapta was talking about earlier. Sure. So we'll take some examples and what we're essentially trying to do is like try to talk through like what each of these steps predominantly looked like in one of these examples. But each of these examples had to be solved by going the entire yeah. whole hawk. So but it, just to help uh, from an audience standpoint for you to understand like, okay, where did the primary step come in and how did we actually go about uh, looking at that solution? And to start with the first example, so, so Hemant uh, Khandilwar, he's basically a, a friend of ThoughtWorks and when we started having conversations with uh, Rivigo, where he actually plays the role of uh, the person who heads uh, innovation, like we started to get some insights into the way uh, Rivigo was starting to uh, look at the kind of users that they were working with, which were predominantly uh, truck drivers in the logistics space. Uh, so how many people here are aware of Rivigo? Not too many? So fine. So let me just quickly give you uh, an idea of what this landscape of logistics looks like and this whole landscape of uh, delivery looks like in India. So in, in India, like obviously, uh, we still are investing in building our infrastructure. And we do have a very constrained rural <coughs> infrastructure set up right now. What this essentially means is that the cost of moving freight is pretty high. And from a comparative standpoint, if it takes about 10% of the GDP in the US and about 8% in Germany, India is about 13 to 14%. So it means that there's a lot more investment needed and a lot more players who need to come up with innovative solutions where uh, they're looking at the, the kind of problems which are there and trying to solve them. Now, in terms of productivity, one way in which productivity is measured in the logistics industry is how long uh, do you travel in a particular time duration. So for India, it is about 15 kilometers an hour in which people are able to traverse distances. Now, what this means is that uh, we are all taking advantage of the e-commerce boom in India. right? But we have a constrained system out there. So it puts a, a lot of pressure in terms of the people who are actually working in the space. And a large part of it are truck drivers. So truck drivers, in terms of trying to cater to the, this particular need which is there, there's already a shortfall of about a million. Uh, uh, a lot of truck drivers are looked down as a low cost, and we have that problem. It's something that we have to acknowledge in India. At the same time, they spend about 25 nights away. So in terms of looking at it from a truck drive as a user, they really have a, a pretty bad space to be in right now. So Rivico started looking at this and started thinking through, okay, how do you solve this particular problem? And that's where starting to empathize with what goes on in a truck driver's life and how do you improve that led to the solution. Now, in terms of the, the solution, a large part of it was looking at, okay, how does a truck driver operate? What is the entire process in which it's happening? So a key innovation that Rivigo brought about is to bring in some form of a relay system. What it essentially means is that you obviously invest in technology, you put in tracking mechanisms, GPS systems into each of the trucks. So you're collecting a lot of telemetry data. Uh, you are collecting at what speeds they are traveling, what the bottlenecks are. You basically throw in all the algorithms around optimization, scheduling, and all of that. But along with that, what Rivico did is that by putting in this relay system, so drivers had to basically go from point A to point B, which was roughly about 200 to 50 kilometers, before that same truck was picked up by the second driver, and that with the relay system continued. At the point where the relay or the bin exchange happened, that the first driver used to take a truck to come back to the point of origin. 
What that meant is that it allowed the drivers a lot more time at home. They're not spending 25 days on the road. Uh, it led to, uh, obviously, a lot of improvement in productivity because more engaged drivers, you're tracking a lot of metrics around them. You're basically trying to make their life a lot more successful given all the constraints around our road infrastructure. And what it meant is that productivity shot up about three times. Uh, in India, about 25% of the rolling stock, which is basically trucks, are usually like sitting idle. And Rubico was able to actually improve that turnaround time by close to about 50%. And so this uh, driver relay model was one of the great things that at least like we started learning about when we started having conversations with Rubico. Uh, so uh, I'll hand over to Sneha to talk about the next step. Again, in any of these examples, we had to go end to end in terms of the design thinking approach, but we'll focus on some key steps. Oh yeah, so empathizing with the user is the first step, uh, and being able to understand you know, what motivates them and what, what problems would are really worth solving for them and designing around that is important. But what do we do with all of that insight that we get from, from uh, understanding the user is that we start to define the problem uh, from the perspective of the user. It's something that you know, we're used to doing in the agile world with, you know, at a micro level with stories, right? We say as a user, blah, blah, blah. But this is about stepping back and ideating itself from that, from that process, from, from the perspective of the user. Um, so it means that we apply that thinking, that user-centered thinking, right from the start, right? From before we even got an idea. Um, so I'm really inspired with, uh, by a client that uh, we're working with uh, right now um, who's in the insurance space. Now, insurance traditionally has been a complicated space, right? I mean, it's a, it's a messy domain. There's, there's so much uh, documentation. There are so many different types of insurance cover. Uh, and our client now is uh, focusing on employee uh, insurance that's employer provided. Uh, and it's, it's a messy place, place to get in because I don't know about you, but my, my experience is while we have great cover uh, that's provided by my employer, i have never really clear what my policy covers, right? And it's not easy to get that information. It's always a few steps away. It always feels tedious to get to that information. There are so many times I've not put in a claim because I know that the process is so heavy. There's so many steps. There's so much documentation that's required. I te generally tend to like stay away from it. It's not something I enjoy doing or that I can you know do painlessly. Um, so is that relatable? Do other people feel that way? Or is it just me? Yeah, insurance is just like a messy area, right, that we don't want to get into. From the employer's side as well, a lot of HR time is spent adjudicating these claims, right? Uh, because if you look at every claim that comes in, see if it's covered by the policy, see if there are any other things they need to look at, and then approve or reject that claim. And a lot of employers do want to get into this space, so they outsource it to somebody else, which is a big expense as well. And then you know, it adds to the process, because now you also have to send it somewhere, and there's, you know, there's, there's that paperwork as well. Um, and most uh, insurance uh, policies that are uh, out there these days are all about curative care. Right? They wait for you to fall sick, go to the hospital, and then reimburse uh, you know, your hospital bills or, or cashless if you, if you can do that. But it's about first falling sick and then, then uh, using your insurance. What our client is doing, if you could step back a step. Yeah, what our client is doing is actually thinking about preventative health care, which is a fantastic idea because uh, the founder believes that, has, has studied this extensively and believes that in Asia, uh, heart disease and uh, diabetes are hitting people in Asia 10 years before it hits the West. Uh, and this is something that's underreported, so it's not something that's as well known. Uh, and she believes that preventative healthcare should be the way forward. It, that, that, that this is what will disrupt the insurance industry. So giving you know, employees the cover for gym memberships or you know, making lifestyle changes such as uh, like an anti-tobacco program or things like that. Right? She's saying that's where your insurance cover uh, should really be, uh, you should be allowed to spend it there. And so what she's doing is she understands, you know, and, and we've been helping her with this, is that the end user doesn't really like to get into this messy area of insurance like you and me. So by actually understanding that user better and seeing what really their problems are and then articulating what we can set as a goal for ourselves, but from the perspective of that end user, it makes all of the difference, right? So she's basically scrapping existing insurance uh, processes, not, by, not constrained by the way the insurance industry is working right now, but is thinking about redesigning it from, from scratch from the perspective of the user. So in this particular case, she's thinking if an employee is, is resistant to putting their, uh, submitting their claims, there's a few reasons why. And so let's try and make it better. Let's, let, let's put the wellness of the employee first. Let, let's uh, have all of the employees start to think about um, their healthcare uh, in a sort of preventative manner. Uh, so they're thinking about having better lifestyles and creating better versions of themselves. And that's a great goal to have. And that's how we've defined the problem uh, in this, for this particular client. And uh, this is something that's hard to measure, right? Uh, the one that says better version of themselves. So we put what we call measures of success on it. 
so that we can track how we're doing on this. And we, these are actual values that we're hoping to give uh, that end user. So that's how we'll, we'll track whether we're getting that user to that goal. And so then we extrapolated from there. We said, okay, great, so the end users, the employees who are actually availing of this service of insurance are, of course, our primary stakeholders. If you, if you take a step back, the HR also has problems, right? They also have the, you know, the hassle of going through your, all of the claims manually and then figuring out the paperwork around it and all of that. So if you can understand their problems and create a goal from their perspective, define the problem from their perspective, and then put some measures of success on that, that's helpful as well. And then we took, took another step back and said, distributors who are actually providing these insurance products to the, uh, em to the employers, who are in turn giving it to their employees, how about solving their problem as well? And so then we, we define a problem from the perspective of the distributor, the insurance product distributor itself as well, and then create a measure of success from it. And then what we did was, you know, this became our, our uh, guide rail for developing the product, for, for figuring out what kind of features need to go into the product. Because if a feature did not help us get better at one of these measures of success, there's no way it was going to get us to this goal. And so we defined our product vision from the perspective of the three um, individual users in the system, and we tried to, and you know, talked about it in terms of what value they will get at the end of it. And wasn't really process oriented, right? About man, about automating a process that's uh, to allow for adjudication of claims, which is mostly manual. It wasn't about just automating that system, but about actually rethinking how we can redesign the whole process of uh, of insurance altogether. So, moving ahead. Uh, so in we so far spoke about uh, really empathizing, defining, but a lot of times, like uh, while we have been talking about being tech at core, sometimes tech is an enabler. And in some situations, tech may not actually be the solution. So we also wanted to talk through uh, one of the examples where really the whole power of ideating becomes very important for the way you solve a problem. And you could take a process where uh, you look at similar class of problems and come up with a solution which is very convergent, <coughs> or you could look at a class of problems, see solutions, and then come up with something which is very, very divergent. And so we want to talk through like one example where we came across where we felt that the way this was solved was really unique in terms of the approach that was taken. So how many of you have, are aware of Arvind Eye Hospital and the approach that they do? That's great to hear. So I'll try and uh, talk through like what they've done, and maybe some of you can chip in, like if you've had a chance to experience them or uh, actually understand much better how they work. Now, so blindness is a global problem. So worldwide, we have about uh, 45 million people who are blind, and every year there are more people who are being added to the list. India contributes to about 25% of global uh, Blindness and this is a problem which can be solved. Uh, essentially, 80% of the cases are preventable. Uh, what it needs is a good set of ophthalmologists which are available to actually uh, work with patients, uh, do surgeries, uh, bring in preventive care. And in certain cases, like uh, there are these intraocular lenses which uh, are available which actually help alleviate it. Now, in India, we do have a constraint system again, like similar to what we are talking about uh, Rivigo in the transport sector. And this is more in terms of the lack of doctors, right? The lack of trained ophthalmologists. So, a typical surgeon can do about 400 surgeries a year. But clearly, like if you look at the scale of the problem in India, which wherein we have 25% of the, the population which is affected by blindness, it is not something which is solvable. And at the same time, like, of importing some of the, the intraocular lenses, the products, it's, it's fairly expensive because each costs a uh, bomb for the typical uh, traditional uh, Indian out there because they are constrained in terms of money as well. So if we look at this constraint system and think about, okay, how <coughs> does one hospital with maybe one ophthalmologist, one nurse, one uh, uh, operating room actually solve this, it is not something which is solvable through the solution. So no matter how much of technology you throw at it, the constraint is really in terms of the kind of people who can actually solve the problem. So the way Arvind IK basically went about trying to solve this is what uh, really 
brings out the whole aspect of like how do you ideate something and come up with something which is a, a really divergent approach. Now, what Dr. Govindappa did is that uh, near Madurai, he started going out to villages where he started recruiting uh, about 100 women and training those women to actually become nurses. So in a way, they were being trained to actually support ophthalmologists, become semi-ophthalmologists. And essentially, along with that, there was also investment that he did in trying to figure out like how do you manufacture these intraocular lenses at a much lower cost. Now, a combination of these two, it may have been enabled by systems, it may have been enabled by software products that I mean, I can obviously either build or leverage off the shelf. But net net, the solution that they came up with in terms of like actually training a set of nurses to actually solve the problem around the constraint around doctors meant that there was a 5x productivity. So instead of a doctor being able to do 400 surgeries, they are now able to do 2,000 surgeries in a particular year. The cost reduction came down because instead of a $150 intraocular lens, the manufacturing cost brought it down to $5. With the nurses who were basically being trained and supporting, the cost of the surgery came down for people. So what this has allowed Arvind Daike to do now is that they're doing close to half a million surgeries in a particular year. So again, like we want to talk through this particular example because this is one where technology is an enabler. Technology is not the only solution. And there are ways in which you could solve problems where uh, you don't always have to like depend upon technology. Uh, ideating and improving the way and taking a divergent approach is something which also works. Yeah. Uh, so moving ahead, uh, before that, did anyone want to share something that they are aware of Arvind Eye Care and any experience? Yeah. I think uh, what I read is that uh, going the bug out uh, ignited the idea about how we can go about it through the McDonald's, the burger. So that's where the mass production was happening at the low, I mean, high volume, low cost. That's where it triggered. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Shermin. Okay, so moving ahead. Um. All right, yeah, so uh, we're moving on to uh, the, the other end of the uh, design you know, uh, thinking um, stages. We were talking about prototyping or building something really simple uh, and getting feedback on it before we're actually going big bang uh, on the launch, which is a, a concept that I'm sure is familiar to all of you. Uh, we, worked, we work uh, with a client that initially started out as a ride hailing service that onboarded uh, hundreds of users, thousands of users onto their platform, as well as thousands of drivers onto their platform. And then they chose to open up more product lines where you know you can actually order a masseuse to come to your place and give you a massage, or, or get someone uh, who's a salon specialist to come to your place and give you some sort of service. Uh, and, and they really widened uh, the spectrum of offerings that they had because they had the assets for it already. They had a, they had a customer base, they had a, they had a driver base that they could uh, leverage. Um, so they started to increase their uh, product lines. And so now they work with all types of merchants and vendors, um, in, and not just drivers anymore. So the problem that they were uh, facing was on how to create a sort of a settlement process with all of the vendors that they were working with, uh, all of the different types of merchants. Uh, if you can move to the next one. Uh, so tracking the cash flow itself became messy. Settlement itself had to be, you know, it was largely manual with these people, spreadsheets <laughs> flying back and forth, and they thought this might be uh, uh, an interesting challenge to solve. Uh, and this is something they could potentially build as a new product that is uh, that that you know is, is available on the merchant side, because uh, basically what they've done is they've aggregated all of these apps into one super app. Um, so they thought maybe on the on the merchant side this is another uh, product they could introduce where settlement can happen through the app. Uh, so, but but what they found was that you know it, it's not as easy uh, as all that, right? Because each merchant has a different settlement process. They have different uh, payment payout methods. Uh, this, this, uh, there's a lot of paperwork and, uh, and manual sort of you know, tracking of all of these expenses uh, that has to happen. Uh, so what they decided to do was to start really small um, to deal with this. What they did was they, they took one actor in this, in, in this entire system, which was their own people, and they said, you know, let's try and figure out if we can solve cash flow problems within our organization. So let's do expense reimbursement uh, for, that our employees, you know, any, any expenses they have and they're traveling and so on. How can, they, uh, how can we start to automate some of that in-house? And so they built this product, they tested it with their own customers, so they sort of dog-fooded that product and said, you know, hey, can we 
are we able to build this out? Is this something that, you know, is this an area that we can get into? They didn't want to invest very highly in this because this is not really in their space. But they wanted to build something simple to see if that, you know, that actually is uh, worth building out further. So they did that. They dog fooded it. They created an expense reimbursement um, application that was being used internally, and that went okay. But it was a point for them to look at it and say, hey, are we doing okay? Should we continue to build this out, or should we just trash this product now and move on to something else, right? Uh, and that worked out okay. So then they looked at another set of actors. You know, they looked at one set of merchants and looked at the transaction between their company and that one set of merchants to see, okay, can we now solve the cash flow problem between this set of merchants and us? Because now we're extending that problem a little bit. Okay, so the previous product sort of worked as a POC to create this new product, right? Because they were just extending uh, on that. And again, they were at this point where they're like, okay, hey, let's go test this with this merchant. See, does this work? Um, does this not work? Should we scrap the product? Should we stop where we are and go back? Uh, or can we continue to build it out? And this, so this is what they continue to do. After a period of time when they started to um, build out uh, this product to satisfy different types of vendors, they found that this really wasn't a product that would scale well. Um, they realized that one single product couldn't really um, you know, uh, solve the problem that everyone was having the system. So then they stopped. They decided to stop where they were uh, and continue to use the product for whatever little it could do. Uh, but they decided you know, this was a good checkpoint for them to say, should we really invest in this further? Maybe not. Let's you know, channel our, uh, our efforts elsewhere. Um, so this, the, the whole concept of your product itself being a proof of concept for you to build out the next version of it uh, is a fairly powerful way of thinking, especially when you know, money is tight. Yeah. Um, so we have another 10 minutes, so we'll try and see if we can wrap up the rest. Uh, so we spoke about the design thinking approach, and I think by now like a lot of you would have realized that it needs teams which really come in with a very different mindset. And this mindset is possibly, when we're talking about solving big, messy problems, that mindset is something which is plus plus agile is what I'll call it right now. But really, the class of problems that we're talking about, it essentially means that the entire team, and when I talk about team, there are different roles, different actors who start coming in. The way they start interfacing with each other, the way they start influencing an organization, has to really like change dramatically. And if we think about like where this complexity is going, like it is just going to grow bigger and bigger. And there are a lot of organizations who are basically going through this digital transformation. They're trying to become digital businesses. Essentially, a large part of it is more different types of users, more interconnections, processes which have been baked into the system which really have to be overhauled completely. Now what this leads is that in terms of some of the, the kind of personas, some of the kind of teams which really become start, start becoming successful in an organization is ones which can deal with the tech complexity, uh, the business complexity, as well as the complexity of how do you grow and onboard people to be able to work in this kind of a culture. So, as we have been working with a lot of clients in the last two, three years, especially clients who are trying to become digital businesses, what we have been realizing, especially in ThoughtWorks, is that there is a lot of need for actually having people and teams who are not afraid to cross silos, who are not af afraid to go across departments when it's needed. So it's basically like people who are actually willing to break down walls. There would be initiatives which are possibly faltering, but a set of go-getters who are going out and actually rescuing these initiatives and taking the onus on themselves on actually bringing that transformation. Because a large part of design thinking is less about process, it's less about the technology. A large part of it is like how do people apply themselves, especially through it. And it goes without saying, it's like a leader with no name, right? You lead without a mandate and that's what's become important for people as well as uh, teams. So, in terms of how the world is changing, let's just do a comparative analysis and Sneha, if you can talk us through that. Yeah, so if we were to rewrite the Agile Manifesto today, uh, given what we know of uh, how the industry is changing, uh, we wrote our own Agile Manifesto style uh, tenets where, you know, there are two things, the thing on the right or bottom in this case is good, but the thing on the top or the left is, is you know, we think is better and needs to be, uh, that's where we need to channel our efforts. And, and the first one I talk about is about uh, not really being uh, not focusing all our efforts on delivery plans, 
because we obsess over that a fair bit, right? Every time we're in an agile team, we're like, oh, story points, velocity, scope. That's what we're talking about all the time. But if we change the conversation and talk more about the value, the measurement of value uh, that we're giving to these end users, whom we've started to empathize with right in the beginning, that would be a better way. We'd be building more uh, valuable products rather than you know worrying about whether we'll do it on time and whether you know we've got the right scope in place and all of that stuff. Not that that isn't important. That should just be an aid. But really, we should be tracking progress by, by the kind of value that we're giving uh, to the end users, which really means putting the user at the heart of the problem rather than you know trying to meet metrics that the business has decided, putting the user at the heart of the, of the problem and the solution <coughs> and figuring out if we're making their life better. Uh, and like Sapto said earlier, we need people that you know are willing to play dynamic roles, right, and not being restricted to the uh, role boundaries that you know traditionally we've all grown up seeing. Or you know we have a fixed jo job description that we all fall in, but rather somebody that's a lot more dynamic, who's able to uh, move across different roles in different uh, different departments to do the best job possible. And what this means is that you know you can't have an, uh, an IT team sitting in a silo saying, hey, we're good at tech, we'll do tech well. Uh, but instead, you, because business models are being crafted around technology, your tech folks also really need to understand business well. They need to be able to wrap their head around business models and build for it, uh, rather than being, you know, waiting for requirements to hit them uh, over the wall and then throw something back again over the wall. And, and really, what we're looking for every team to do is to be able to take a step back, not just look at the immediate problem that they're trying to solve, but look at the larger picture and see, you know, this, the ecosystem that we that we like we've told you in all of the examples. So the problem is not you know, a point problem, right? It's all, it's all about taking a step back and looking at the larger ecosystem and seeing are we really making an impact uh, in the larger ecosystem. And requirement elicitation is a very like transactional process that we're used to, right? Because at the end of the day, we wanted to create like a spec document. Uh, but what we really want to uh, emphasize now is having meaningful conversations, because that's how you bring about empathy and that's how you bring about curiosity in your team to solve the right problems. So having more meaningful conversations, challenging, questioning what users really want, uh, and whether our, pro our solutions actually solving a user's problem uh, will require much more meaningful conversations than we have uh, traditionally had. Yeah, and in addition to like those conversations around users, a large part of it is like uh, helping with the entire change initiative which organizations have to go through, which means conversations which are also in terms of working with teams which have built and maintained systems for ages, and how do you change that given some of the processes which have to change? And finally, we can no longer have roles in teams that say, hey, I'm not a techie, right? I don't get technology. We can't afford to have that anymore because technology is so ingrained in everything that we do uh, that now understanding technology well and figuring out you know, what business problems this tech can be applied to or how you can leverage the tech to create a business model uh, is going to be more important than just being aware of what it is. Uh, think back, think again about Netflix, right? If, if, I did, if I didn't understand what streaming was like, there's no way I'd be able to create a, uh, a business model around it and offer that as a service to my customers. Yeah, and to flip it on its head, it's also technologists who come in, not with a specific solution and this is the technology stack that we would want to solve a problem, but sometimes maybe technology is not going to give you the solution, as we saw in one of the examples with Arvind Daike. And that is the kind of uh, collaboration people that we're talking about. And so while those are some, you know, some good things to keep in mind uh, for teams, as we go forward, the kind of people that we would like to recruit into these in these teams, you know, we have to think about whether they bring these traits to the table. Right? These are traits that we will have to all, if we don't already inherently have it, we'll have to start to learn to develop it, because this is what is going to be valued. Uh, interview processes should ideally be designed uh, to figure out if people have these traits inherently in them. right? Uh, because empathy, like we've said, is such an important part of, of the world going forward. Um, being Having, having uh, sort of the resourcefulness and, and taking leadership uh, being able to be dynamic, these are some of the traits that you will start to uh, value in people more. Uh, and those are the kinds of people that we will want to bring on on more teams uh, going forward. Yeah. So we want to end with a sl small video. I'll just give you some context around that video before we start it. So this is a client that we worked with in uh, Toronto called Natural Food Markets. And essentially it's a, a grocery chain and they sell a lot of organic produce. and. In terms of one of the key problems that they wanted to solve was how do they make payments seamless within one of their stores and then take it out to different stores. So the video will talk through the, obviously the approach that has been taken and the whole collaboration which had to be done between uh, business leaders in natural foods, people in ThoughtWorks having to put on multiple hats to really understand it from a design thinking <coughs> approach and then how do you solve it specifically for this class of problem. This 
significance of the new restaurant and store concept was to integrate, number one, first integrate a market concept, a, a what we call you know, retail food concept, into a uh, food service concept. From there, we felt and knew that we needed to really operationalize the space and make it very, very efficient. It's in a mall, it's one of the largest malls uh, in all of Canada, it's one of the most populous. We have hundreds of thousands of people who are passing by the restaurant on a weekly basis, and we knew that we had to provide a great service to those customers through offering food quickly to them, as well as offering great food, which is providing organic and natural food, food that is you know, antibiotic free, hormone free, that is local, what has been a real focus of ours, and bringing that all together was really what we set out to do. From day one, he had a very, very clear vision about creating a very unique customer experience, whether it was in their restaurants or if it was in their grocery formats. And that's, I think, what grocers and retailers today are faced with. It takes them from being undifferentiated to being completely differentiated. We knew that everything had to be consistent from both the customer experience and also behind the scenes for the data. And so we decided to pick technologies that were both mature enough to support what we needed, but not so bound up with their decisions that it dictated the vision that Natural Markets was able to take. When we opened the Rich Tree Natural Market restaurants here at the Eaton Center, we put together the best in technology to really allow the customer to have the choice. Our goal is to let the customer pay any way they want throughout our entire market area. From an operational perspective, we really wanted to find a way to bring together many ways of ordering that is transparent to the customer so that they can order while they're on a train and pick up their meal that are expressed to go. At the same time, we wanted to be able to allow a customer to stand at a kiosk and order from multiple kitchens while sitting at our foundation barn enjoying a drink. We created a, a, a mobile application that allowed our customers to quickly download it, associate it to a credit card, and then utilize it at every station, keep track of their orders, and it enabled them to really feel like they had one form of payment that they could quickly utilize or furnish across these stations without having to take out a credit card or without having to see multiple transactions on their bill. Our core focus was how are we gonna really improve payment and people being able to enjoy great food across multiple areas. So getting in depth with Market Pass, we took a multi-pronged approach to this, and we started with a minimum viable product. The minimum viable product hits at the core of our message around service augmentation and allows a customer to check out quickly. That's it. Another area that we really focused on was children, you know, making it a family-friendly environment. So you can see you know, what we did with the children's interactive wall. We call it the, the Market Garden. It's a farm type theme, so it's consistent with the Rich Tree Natural Market brand, but it allows kids to have a good time. We have tables nearby where parents can enjoy a meal while their kids you know, play and, and have a good time. Natural Markets is really doing something important for society. Uh, the importance of getting uh, healthy and organic food to people during the midst of a busy work day uh, through their location in shopping centers, their, their grocery stores, and, and the combination stores like the Eaton Center here with a, a restaurant and a grocery together, uh, we truly got excited on getting behind this. The industry itself is growing, and to have a, a player with the integrity of the natural markets folks doing the bold things they're doing, you know, we couldn't ask for a better partner. We've got to continue to, to strive to take a mobile experience, which is a very individual experience, and really make that personal. So in terms of going into a grocery store and buying food on your mobile phone and not even having to interact with a cashier, that's something that we absolutely want to do, but we also want to ensure that we're still providing a great experience. Thank you. So that's what we have.